John doesn't need an introduction to this group. Uh, most of you, I presume, will have read at least one of his papers, uh, if not many of them. Um, but I think it's really great. John, um, maybe you don't know his background, but he did his undergrad at uh, Cambridge, then did a, a PhD with Dick Passingham at Oxford, before working with Mort Mishkin at NIH in Bethesda, did a quick sojourn to Durham University for 10 years, and is, since 1994, he's a um, professor of cognitive neuroscience at Cardiff University. And um, John is, of course, a leading author on the, on um, the thalamus, but not only the thalamus, I think lots of subcortical structures, which he really pioneered by not looking at one modality. I think that's the really interesting bit of his work, but he combines, goes between especially uh, rodents and humans, but also looks at behavioral neuroscience versus neuropsychology and neuroanatomy uh, knowledge. And um, I'm always amazed by his neuroanatomy knowledge, and I always learn a lot when I talk to him about this, about the circuits, how they work. So it's really fantastic. John, of course, has published over 300 papers, and um, he is also a fellow of the Royal Society. So um, we're delighted to have him here today. And uh, John, if you could start sharing your slides, and then the floor is yours. Right. Um, <clears throat> hopefully that's all working and hopefully everyone can see everything. Just a, a thumbs up from you, Michael, would be great. Yeah, I can see it. Thank you. Lovely. That's great. I'm just going to get rid of that. Right. Perfect. So first of all, thank you hugely for that introduction, Michael. Thank you hugely, Julio, for um, setting the scene so well. Um, I'm apologizing in advance that, of course, this my talk is principally about basic neuroscience rather than imaging, but hopefully it lays out a lot of the issues and problems that many of us are very familiar with um, and maybe will give you some new information and insights. That's, fingers crossed. Um, also, can I say it's lovely to see such an array of people at this meeting, names, of course, lots of names I recognize, also names I don't recognize, and that's wonderful as well, and just welcome you all to the world of the thalamus if it's not your principal area of research. Okay, this is um, Cardiff, where I have been working for the last 25 years and where most of the research I'm talking about was done. I'm going to give you a tiny bit of history just to kick things off. It'll be very familiar to you all, but it's no harm in reminding you that, of course, damage to the diencephalon and the medial diencephalon has for a very, very long time been associated with memory loss. So one of the first described amnesic syndromes, the amnesic Korsakoff syndrome, was linked to pathology in the diencephalon as long ago as 1896. And that was in the mammary bodies. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the notion that mammary body damage is a constant feature of this form of amnesia. Over more recent decades, it's become clear that mammary body damage is certainly not a sufficient predictor of what's going on and that a better predictor of the memory loss may well be atrophy in the anterior thalamic nuclei. And that's signaled in this um, box on the right by the arrow. It's worth pointing out that pathology and the linking of that to memory loss in the diencephalon was way ahead of what we knew in medial temporal lobe and medial temporal lobe amnesia. So Bechterev is usually given the honor of first linking hippocampal damage to memory loss. But I think we all know that it wasn't until the 1950s that this idea of hippocampal centric uh, pathology causing severe amnesia really took off. So people studying diencephalic amnesia were 50 years ahead of those studying medial trempel lobe amnesia. However, history, as I think this has been hinted at, has treated the two regions very differently. If you, for example, just type into Google Scholar hippocampus memory and thalamus memory, you'll find that hippocampus memory gets a million and 360,000 more results. It's like the hippocampus is this sort of whirlpool that sucks researchers in. And um, as I think Julia was, it was, in, was um, pointing out, um, some reviewers don't understand that there's more going on in the brain 
beyond the medial temporal lobes and it's for us to um, educate others and treat the brain as a sort of balanced whole and find out much more about it. So my talk is going to be about the anterior thalamic nuclei and for those of you who don't work on the anterior thalamic nuclei uh, very simply you just need to know that guess what they're at the front of the um, thalamus they consist of three principal nuclei the anterodorsal nucleus the anteroventral nucleus and the anteromedial nucleus and the anteromedial nucleus and anteroventral nucleus are sometimes combined together and called the principal nucleus in humans their structure and arrangement and actually their principal projections and connections are remarkably conserved across um, certainly um, rats and monkeys and to a large degree we have every reason to believe that's true in humans so this is my epiphany moment this is the moment when i looked down a microscope and went do you know what i really really need to find out more about this bit of the brain i was working with uh, mort mishkin uh, in his lab in the early 1980s and we were asking the very simple question if the hippocampus is important for memory and medial diencephalon is important for memory how does the hippocampus connect with the medial diencephalon of course we knew about the very well known direct projection via the fornix to the mammary bodies we knew that the mammary bodies projected to the anterior thalamic nuclei because of course these are key elements of pape circuit which like it or not has been around since 1937 and as i will remind you repeatedly has had a huge influence in the way people think what i noticed was that there is this heavy direct projection from the hippocampus it actually comes from the cerebellum to the anterior thalamic nuclei it's in an intriguing position because what it does is place the anterior thalamic nuclei in this strategic location where it's getting both indirect inputs from mammary bodies and these are incredibly dense inputs it, it may well be that every nucleus every neuron in the mammary bodies projects to the anterior thalamic nuclei via the mammoth thalamic tract tract but on top of that we have these direct projections so the anterior thalamic nuclei are poised to receive a sort of double dose of hippocampal inputs now to test the significance of that I moved to working with animals because we just do not have pathological conditions that allow us to make the comparisons that I wanted to begin with. So we made lesions in the um, hippocampus, the fornix, the mammary bodies and the anterior thalamic nuclei, so these steps along this pathway here, and tested consequences on spatial memory. We looked at spatial memory because of course we knew that hippocampus, certainly rodent hippocampus, is absolutely vital for spatial memory. And I'm going to use this task and it'll crop up repeatedly in this talk. It's not the only task we use, I hasten to add, but I thought it'd be simpler just to stick uh, with one task um, so I don't have to describe lots of others. It's called T maze alternation and put it simply, the rat is placed in a T maze. It runs down to get food but there's a barrier so it's forced it doesn't know which way it's going to have to go in this case it's forced to go to this location here and where it will eat food the rat's picked up placed at the start again the barrier is removed and now on the test run the rat has a free choice when it gets to this point and the correct choice is to go to the opposite arm now there's food there because of course it wasn't didn't explore it to begin with and it eats that food and that's a correct trial you then start a completely new trial with a new information trial and test trial. So what happens when you make lesions in those key interlinked areas? Hippocampal lesions produce, and these are very large aspiration lesions, produce really severe deficits. 50% uh, is chance. Mammary body lesions produce a deficit, but it's not as severe as the deficits you see after either anterior thalamic lesions or fornix lesions and those produce deficits that look very comparable to each other and of course the fact that mammary body lesions disrupt the task but not to the same degree as these others fits very nicely with this connection that i already looked at in other words this direct connection from the hippocampus to the anterior thalamic nuclei so that mammary body damage might not be so severe because of this extra innovation 
we can look at that relationship a bit more precisely by now actually lesioning the mammothalamic tract. So this is the tract that goes from the mammary bodies to the anterior thalamic nuclei. This is work done by Sarah and Van, who's become a real world expert on studying the mammary bodies. And very simply, the effects of mammary uh, thalamic tract lesions are essentially identical to lesions of the mammary bodies. You can see that the data overlap each other on this task. So again, consistent with the idea that what we're seeing from the mammary bodies is an effect on their output to the anterior thalamic nuclei. So this brings us to the first really obvious but critical question. The anterior thalamic nuclei and hippocampus both produce spatial memory tasks, but are these tasks caused by the fact these two areas need each other? Are they actually interdependent? Now, going back 20 years, the only way to test this really was by a cross lesion. In other words, you'd make a lesion, a unilateral lesion of a structure in one hemisphere, and you combine it with a lesion of the other structure you're interested in, but that would be a unilateral lesion in the opposite hemisphere. And if the two structures need each other, and if they're connected largely by uh, ipsilateral connections, what you should see is that that will produce a deficit. This is a famous Morris Water Maze task. Um, it's a study I, I did with Claire Warburton uh, quite some time ago now. And basically the animal is searching for this escape platform. So it's gonna spend more time in this, as it turns out, the blue colored quadrant. And basically animals with this disconnection between the anterior thalamic nuclei and the hippocampus show an apparent lack of spatial memory. They're not learning where to go. So this is telling us that these two structures do in, in fact need each other, but this method is very crude in some respects. It can't tell you if that's because the hippocampus, this is caused by hippocampal projections to the anterior thalamus or vice versa. And we can't tell if, it, if these effects are caused by direct connections or indirect connections. We need a more sophisticated way to do this. So now I'm going to talk about a series of studies in which we've used DREADS. So DREADS are designer receptors exclusively activated by designing drugs. And this cartoon very briefly gives you an idea of what's going on, that the DREAD designer is actually embedded within a viral vector. And that allows the DREAD to be expressed. The DNA is, uh, of that vector is uh, expressed. Um, and you can vary the type of um, dread that you use. Um, so for example, you can have an inhibitory dread or an excitatory dread. All the experiments I'm going to describe use inhibitory dreads. And what happens is you inject the virus with the dread. The virus in this case is an adenovirus and it will be transported anterogradely down axons. And that means it'll accumulate over a period of time to the places where the site you've injected projects to. You then need to give the animal a drug which will work on those terminals, on where the dread has got to. And the drug we use is clozapine. And you can inject it um, systemically, for example, intraperitoneally, or, um, which is what we're going to do in this particular task, to begin with anyway. And the animals are going to be given a TMAZE alternation task. So the top A here just shows the standard task I've just shown you. It looks a bit odd because it's not a, it doesn't look like a T maze. It's got, it's like a cross, but the top part of that is not being used. There's a barrier across it. The reason for the forearms becomes very obvious when I explain this modified rotation underneath. Here, the experiment is exactly the same as I described earlier. So the rat has a sample run where it's forced to go in one direction to a particular place. Again, a barrier is removed, but during that interval, the entire maze is rotated, in this case, 180 degrees. What that means is that the correct choice is actually, although it's in the opposite location, is actually physically the same arm that it went down to get the reward to begin with. So it's arm two on this instance. And what that means is that you're now putting in conflict extra maze cues from intra maze cues. And you'll see the effect of that very soon. 
So this is a series of studies uh, that Andrew Nelson uh, conducted, and I have to thank him immensely. Um, and to start off with, we begin fairly simply and then build it up. So to start off with, we inject the dreads into the dorsal subiculum. The dorsal subiculum, because it's the subiculum that projects to the anterior thalamic nuclei, amongst other sites, and dorsal subiculum because that's the principal um, source of these projections. And then you activate the dreads using clozapine, so these white histograms with clozapine, and we also have a viral control. So this is an inert um, viral construct uh, th that is similar in many other respects, though. And what you can see is that on the standard TMAs task when the dread is switched on and the subiculum efferents are sort of inhibited, nothing very obvious is happening. On the other hand, as soon as you put extra maze cues in conflict with intra maze cues, and the animals have to use the extra maze cues, a deficit appears, which is the kind of thing you'd expect from a hippocampal deficit. The fact that the animals are okay on the standard TMAs is not so surprising. These are not complete hippocampal formation lesions, of course. These are just selective disruptions of the dorsal subiculum. Now let's move on to the anterior thalamic nuclei. We inject the dread into the anterior thalamic nuclei. Here's an image here, like this. We then give the animals, or the experimental animals, the clozapine to activate the dread before testing them. And on the standard TMAs, the data is a bit noisy, as you can see here, but as soon as we move to this rotated version, where the animals again are much more reliant on extra maze cues, we can see a clear deficit appears. So both um, dorsal subiculum lesions and anterior thalamic lesions caused by dreads have this very similar profile of effects on this spatial task. Now the next step is to test the direct relationship between these two structures. So here, we're going to look at the effect of disrupting dorsal subiculum projections to the anterior thalamic nuclei. So the dread is injected into the dorsal subiculum. It um, moves down axons to its terminals. And here you can see the anterior thalamic nuclei are beautifully lit up um, because the, the um, fluorescent tracer is the anterior thalamic nuclei. But in these same animals, we have an indwelling cannula located in the anterior thalamic nuclei. And that means we can inject the clozapine directly into that site. So what we can do is, is selectively inhibit or disrupt the projections from the dorsal subiculum to the anterior thalamic nuclei. And when we do that and test them on the TMAs, we don't get a significant effect on the standard task, but again, on that rotation task, we get a deficit. Um, once they're more reliant, so it's there on distal spatial cues. We can then do the reverse experiment. So now we're going to test the impact of putting a dread into the anterior thalamic nuclei, disrupting its projection to the subiculum. This is the subiculum and presubiculum here. And again, no obvious effect on the standard TMAs task, but once you make extra maze and intra maze cues, in conflict, a very sizable deficit appears. Now, a really important conclusion from this is that both directions of actions are vital. So it would be wrong to see the anterior thalamic nuclei as a subsidiary of the hippocampus, that they really are acting as partners. And I think it's very important because even, this is a, a, a concept that sounds so obvious but yet actually it's been quite difficult to fight against. And the reason it's been difficult to fight against comes back to dear old Pape circuit. Um, in that image that Julia showed from my paper with Malcolm Brown in 1999, we had a picture that looked rather like this. And I have to say in 1999, my head was still very clouded with the idea of a set of connections that look a bit like this and that the anterior thalamic nuclei are part of some loop that's some um, coming out from the hippocampus, but ultimately, despite some other interesting excursions, is going to end back there. And this is something I really, really want to dissuade you from um, in the course of this talk. First of all, it's obviously wrong, because if the anterior thalamic nuclei are contributing something so important, then they must be contributing something novel. 
this isn't, you can't just have a sort of pipeline where nothing happens. Something novel and interesting is happening. And I'm going to give you some examples to reinforce that idea. So here's one example. And this is a switch now to uh, clinical studies. Uh, and this actually involved Andrew Mays, whose uh, quote was mentioned in the introduction. Um, so there's a group of researchers. We looked at patients who had what are known as colloid cysts. These are benign tumors in the third ventricle. And you can see top left patient with a colloid cyst. And surgeons want to remove them because these are life threatening. However, the cysts adhere very often to the fornix. They cause ventricular dilation. You can see that bottom left. And quite often, you see um, pathological changes and atrophy. Now, this is extreme in the patient here. Most of the patients don't, I mean, the fornix is intact and they look quite much, much more normal. This case is extreme, the fornix has actually been lost. But I want you to focus on the mammillary bodies right down here, which, as you can see, are very small compared to how they should look in a control brain. Now, we've studied over 30 of these patients. They are rare, so this is uh, quite a sizable group. And we looked at the relationship between size of a whole variety of brain structures in them and cognitive performance, and in particular interest in memory. And only one brain structure correlated with memory, but it correlated over and over again, not with short-term memory, but with long-term memory. And that was the mammary bodies. Here's the uh, pattern of relationship of mammary body volume in all these colitis patients against the WIMS general memory index. It's a very clear relationship. The smaller the mammary bodies, the poorer your memory performance. Here's a very similar looking graph now. This is the data for recall up here, top left, is actually from a variety of, of tests combined to give an index score. And you see that same um, positive association. However, if you look across at recognition memory, you see no relationship at all. There is no hint of a relationship between the memory body volume here and performance on the test of recognition memory you gave. Likewise, there's no relationship between hippocampal volume and performance on these memory tasks, both for recall and for recognition. Now, that's not terribly surprising in one sense because this is not specifically a pathology of the temporal lobe, but again, it highlights that when nothing obviously gross is happening in the hippocampus, but something is happening with the memory bodies, we can see what looks like a very obvious memory impairment. I'll give you a second example. This is much more recent work uh, conducted by Beth Frost with Shane O'Mara in Dublin. Um, and it's a really extraordinary finding. And I'll be quite honest with you, we don't have a proper explanation for it, but I don't think that matters for the purposes of this talk. They simply ask the question, what happens when you lesion the anterior thalamic nuclei, either permanently or temporarily, to spatial signaling in the subiculum? So on the left here, we have uh, spatial neurons in, these are awake moving rats, of course, and we have a place cell from the dorsal subiculum, a head direction cell. You can see its preferred orientation of firing here. So these are cells that have like a sort of compass-like uh, affinity that they tell the animal which direction it's facing. These are border cells, and these are the famous grid cells um, that I'm sure you're all familiar with as well. When you lesion the anterior thalamic nuclei, none of these are found. Uh, Beth failed to find any spatial cells in the dorsal speculum, these animals with anterior thalamic lesions. Um, so this is an absolutely startling uh, loss of that property, even though the, the, in many, many other ways, the firing of these neurons looked very normal. What was missing was that critical spatial information and different types of information. Now, we don't know exactly why this effect happens. We don't know exactly what's driving it, whether it's direct or, or partially indirect. But what it's telling you immediately is that the anterior thalamic nuclei are providing something that the hippocampus lacks. Because obviously, if the hippocampus already had it, it wouldn't lose it following this anti these anterior thalamic lesions. And the third example of something that the anterior thalamic nuclei are adding that the hippocampus doesn't seem to, to 
contribute to or have is actually to do with attention. And it's only in recent years that we've been thinking very hard about the anterior thalamic nucleine attention. We've been thinking about the anterior thalamic nucleine space for a long, long time. But in 2015, uh, we published a paper that made us completely think again about aspects of anterior thalamic function. So I'm going to talk through this task. Um, I, it, it's going to look a bit complicated, but I hope I'll keep it simple. Imagine you're a rat and you've been given a, a discrimination to make. And here you've got to dig in these pots for food. And the rule is very simple. If you dig in a pot that smells of cinnamon, you'll get food. If you dig in a pot that smells of ginger, you won't. And it doesn't matter what texture of media or stuff that you're digging in. That's irrelevant. It's the smell that matters. You learn that to a criterion, then you're given a second discrimination. Again, smell matters. So in this case, tarragon is always correct. And in this case, fenugreek, whatever fenugreek really is, um, that smell is not. So you avoid that and you just select tarragon. You ignore the type of media that you're digging in. Takes the third discrimination. Again, it's the odor that matters. So marjoram is the one you're going to dig in. And the fourth one, it's cumin and don't dig in dill. And again, you ignore, because they don't predict reward, the type of thing you're digging in. And what you see is that animals get better and better over these successive discriminations. And this is called an intradimensional set. And this task uh, was originally devised by uh, Birrell and Verity Brown. And the assumption is that animals get quicker on this because they learn to attend to the dimension that's, that's predictive of reward. So they get more and more keyed in to attending to odor, but ignoring the texture, the media that they are digging in, because that is, it doesn't predict anything. However, and this is a clever part of the experiment, um, you then shift. So the next discrimination looks the same, but it's critically different. Now the texture predicts reward. So, oops. So digging in polystyrene will give you a reward, irrespective of the smell. Digging in the beanbag media won't. You ignore the smell because it will not predict reward, but the texture does. And what normal animals do, unsurprisingly, is they show a cost. In other words, they take more trials to learn this discrimination because they are having to switch from focusing on odors to now attending to textures. So there is this cognitive shift across and that causes this cost because it takes them more trials. What about um, that shift cost? Um, how is it regulated? Well, unsurprisingly, frontal lesions exaggerated. And that's consistent with the whole notion that I'm sure you're all familiar with that the classic element of frontal damage is people behaving in a perseverative, inflexible way. And just as humans do it, so do rats. And they show this exaggerated shift cost as it takes them longer to shift from relying, in this case, on odors to shift to media. What about anterior thalamic lesions? Well, the pattern here is strikingly different. The animals with anterior thalamic lesions seem to be unable to benefit from these repeated initial discriminations. In other words, they didn't show an interdimensional set. They didn't get quicker and quicker over learning when learning the successive discrimination. So that in itself is already different to prefrontal lesions. What about that shift? So this is the critical moment when you shift and the animals should take more trials to learn because you've now gone from, in this case, odors to medium. To our astonishment, rats with anterior thalamic lesions showed the complete opposite. I mean, this is this is, on the face of it, incredibly paradoxical. What they're now doing, animals that were poor at learning these discriminations, suddenly are quicker at learning this shifted discrimination. They're sh quicker at learning about polystyrene. So they show a, a shift benefit. This is, on the face of it, really perverse and really unusual. And we were astonished. And I'll be quite honest, we, in some respects, did not believe the result. So we did the entire experiment again, complete new set of animals, complete new, uh, ran the whole thing through again, exactly the same result, this shift benefit. 
It's also worth pointing out that what we little we know about hippocampal lesions on this task suggests that they, like prefrontal lesions, cause an increase in shift cost. In other words, their pattern, their profile is very different to anterior thalamic lesions. And I want to make that point because it's bringing into play a set of attributes that are not hippocampal by their nature. How can this come about? Well, animal learning theorists um, had argued and, and sort of, you know, in the nicest possible way, argued with each other that there were there was either a system that used uh, that encouraged, drove animals to attend or people to attend to good predictors. Uh, Nick McIntosh argued that this is the this is the this is how animals learn to do these tasks that they learn that things in the past that were good predictors or reward, that's what you should attend to. These, these are the things to go for. And so you attend to them. On the other hand, John Pierce and Jeffrey Hall argued, no, 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 Mick, Nick, you're completely wrong. It's the absolute opposite. What animals do is attend to poor predictors. And the reason they attend to poor predictors is because they actually give you more information. In other words, if you attend to reliable things in your environment, there's very little information to be gained. If you attend to poor predictors, on the other hand, there's the possibility that something interesting may happen and you'll be in a good place to benefit from that. So the two schools argued with each other for decades and then finally got together and decided, you know what? Maybe both systems, both of us are right and that both systems exist in the brain. And our data is utterly consistent with that. And I filled in the bits that would, be, that would make the best sense. So the anterior thal thalamic nuclei are part of this um, attend to good predictor system, and that things like prefrontal cortex are part of this, when they're functioning normally, attend to poor predictors. And I'm going to focus on this part of the system. So I'm now going to move to cortical anterior thalamic uh, interactions. And we're going to go back to using uh, dreads, exactly as I described earlier. This is work done by Emma Bubb. And we can put dreads into the anterior, uh, the anterior cingulate cortex and then give the animals clozapine. So this is just systemic clozapine. And what you see and the animals with this inhibitory dread here are these ones um, in red. Controls are in blue. And when you get to the critical test here, you see here's the cost as the animals are now switching from in this, uh, odors to media but lo and behold animals with anterior cingulate dreads so in other words this is inhibiting or disrupting their outputs are showing a shift benefit so that profile is obviously similar to what we saw after anterior thalamic lesions so we can go one step further this is what emma bub did we can test if the projections from the cingulate cortex to the anterior thalamic nuclei support this by putting the dread into the anterior cingulate cortex, but then putting the clozapine just into the anterior thalamic nuclei. So this is the, these are the outputs from the anterior cingulate cortex we're gonna focus on. And again, you can just really focus on this key part of the experiment here. This is that shift on what you're seeing is that the normal animals show the shift cost, but the animals uh, with this anterior, sing anterior cingulate, anterior thalamic nuclei disruption show a modest shift benefit. And you can actually see it more clearly here in this graph here. So they're showing that same profile as we saw after anterior cingulate uh, systemic injections, but also after anterior thalamic lesion injections, consistent with the idea that um, this system relates back to these interactions between anterior cingulate cortex and the anterior thalamic nuclei. And if you look here, you can see where in the anterior thalamic nuclei those cingulate dreads ended up, and they predominantly terminate in the anterior medial nucleus. And the relevance of that will come back in just a minute. So the idea is that what happens with anterior thalamic lesions is that you lose this predictive, attend to good predictors system. And so now you're more driven by this uncertainty driven mechanism that you attend to poor predictors. And that attended to poor predictors means you're bad on the first set of discriminations, but when you have to switch and now 
go to what in the past was a poor predictor, you're actually in a better place than other animals, um, whilst the converse pattern of behavior will be seen after prefrontal lesions. So, I'm going to go back to Pape circuit, which I think is sort of the root of so many uh, errors, certainly in my thinking over the years. And I want to point out a couple of ways in which this circuit is just fundamentally wrong. Um, for the moment, I'm just going to talk about subiculum and cingulate cortex, in particular, retrospinal cortex, because this is the image that we were sort of, you know, it's a textbook, 1937 image. If you put traces into the mammary bodies, so this is a retrograde chorotoxin, and you put fast blue into retrospinal cortex, so two different traces, what you see in the dorsal subiculum is a huge number of neurons lit up because these are neurons that are projecting to retrospinal cortex. Likewise, a huge number of neurons that are lit up because they project the mammary bodies, again, in the subiculum. Now, what's fascinating is that actually a lot of these projections are coming from the same neurons. So there are individual neurons that are collateralizing and projecting both to the mammary bodies and to retrospinal cortex. And this slide here astonishingly shows this beautifully because if you put the tracer into the mammary bodies, it actually goes back into the subiculum and will then go anterogradely down it, those collaterals from the same neuron and you get this collateral collateral transport and there's the termination in retrospinal cortex in layers two and three. So if we go into a bit more detail here, this is the dorsal spiculum. And what you're looking for are double labeled cells, cells that have picked up tracer from both retrospinal cortex and the mammary bodies. And these are here. And there's lots of them. Uh, we counted about 45% of the subiculum projections for retrospinal cortex. But in any time you do this kind of experiment, that proportion will be an underestimate of the reality. So let's, but let's call it around half. Why does that matter? Well, once you start redrawing Pape circuit, actually how, how things are connected up, you see it very differently. Here's that collateral route that I just spoke about, subiculum to the mammary bodies and retrospinal cortex, which places the anterior thalamic nuclei in a fascinating place because of course now it is receiving from and interlinked places that are getting simultaneous inputs from the same neurons. And as you look at it, instead of it being a sort of circuit that goes around from the hippocampus out to the thalamus and back again, it's looking more and more like a sort of output route that's taking up to the cortex. And in particular, retrospinal cortex stands out as a convergent target from the hippocampus and the subiculum and the anterior thalamic nuclei. Now, we've known for a long time that the anterior thalamic nuclei have a very important relationship with retrospinal cortex. We've known, for example, that anterior thalamic lesions can, in very intriguing ways, severely disrupt retrospinal cortex activity. So quite some time ago, uh, with Trish Jenkins and others since then, we've shown that lesions of the anterior thalamic nuclei cause a spectacular decrease in the expression of immediate early gene signaling. So the brown blobs here are cells that are positive for the immediate early gene C FOS or expression of FOS. Um, and you can see on this side in the retrospinal cortex, there is far less signal than on this side. And you don't, don't, for example, see this dense band at layer two, layer three. And the image below is just to show that this difference is not because the cells are missing. This is these are nissel state cells. The neurons are there. It's just that they're now not expressing CFOS. And the same is true for other image early genes, such as ZIF. Uh, this slide here shows you how anterior thalamic lesions can disrupt plasticity in retrospinal cortex. This actually is looking at long-term depression. This is work done by Zaf Bashir in Bristol. And very briefly, you can induce long-term depression with one hertz pulses. Um, but if you try the same experiment in animals with an anterior thalamic lesion, these are slices, and these are unilateral lesions. So this is the side of the lesion, and the other side is contralateral control size. The depression is lost. In other words, there's no, there's the depression there, there's the um, peak amplitude, 
is diminished compared to the uh, your control electrode here you're not seeing that difference so all i'm trying to point out is that retrospinal cortex activity is in a variety of ways very dependent on the anterior thalamic nuclei and their inputs so in the last sort of few slides i'm going to remind you that we have to think about the anterior thalamic nuclei as not a unitary thing but as a group of nuclei that have different slightly different connections and different functions. I think this idea has been very familiar for, with people for the anterodorsal nucleus because we've known for a long time that it is a really important relay for head direction information. That information comes from the mammary bodies, goes to the anterior thalamic nuclei, and there, amongst other places, it goes to parahippocampal regions. And we know that if you lesion the anterior dorsal nucleus, um, the area around it, you lose head direction signals from these parahippocampal areas. In other words, that this relay is, is dependent. So people would be very comfortable with the idea that the anterodorsal nucleus has this role in navigation because of head direction. And I think in some respects, however interesting that is, that has rather occluded people from realizing that the rest of the anterior thalamic nuclei, the other two nuclei, are also really important for space, but for different reasons. Um, this is a study going back some time, um, but it makes an important point. This is that teammate's alternation task, and all we're doing is comparing the effects of lesions in the anterior medial nucleus with lesions that involve the anterior ventral and anterior dorsal nucleus. And what you can see is that they both impair this task, that's the data here, but if you combine the lesions, you get a bigger deficit. The point being that if the loss of head direction cells was all that was explaining the spatial navigational deficits of animals with anterior thalamic lesions, all the deficit would be seen on this green group here, and that would be the same size as the complete lesion, but it's not. In other words, the anterior medial nuclei are contributing something important as well. And exactly the same year as we did this experiment by and um, John Darrell Alford published very similar findings when comparing the anteroventral nucleus and anteromedial nucleus. In other words, different, the three different nuclei are all contributing some way to give the total importance of these nuclei. Now, I don't want to go into great details about the anatomy. I mean, Michael alluded to the fact that if I get started talking about anatomy, there's no stopping me. So I will be very brief, but I just want to make the point now, it's not just the anterodorsal nucleus that has a different set of connectivities. The anteroventral nucleus and the anteromedial nucleus are different. Anteromedial is different because, for example, it has far greater connectivity with frontal areas, prelimbic cortex in rats, and with anterior cingulate cortex. And I pointed that out for the attentional task. Anteroventral nucleus is much more connected, for example, with the retrospinal cortex, and in particular with granular. And that's the part the subiculum projects to. We have hypothesized that the anteroventral nucleus is important for space and context. It shows um, it is the main uh, area with theta firing cells in the anterior thalamic nuclei. And there's data from recent studies of its importance for encoding and retrieval of spatial information, and that these might be key interactions. And from medial nucleus, on the other hand, is much more, as we said, interlinked with frontal areas. But at the same time, its hippocampal connections are different from those of the anteroventral nucleus. So different parts of the subiculum, different neurons project to the anteroventral nucleus and to the anteromedial nucleus. And these can be re uh, related to their different enterorhinal inputs. Now, these are early days in trying to test these ideas, but I'm alerting you to the fact that the anatomy is making some very clear predictions about how there is a partial segregation of both information and, and the actions upon that information within these three nuclei. And I think with Shane O'Mara, we, try, we want to sort of remind you or to think of the kind of how this slots into the bigger picture, that you want, need to combine a variety of cognitive abilities. I've spoken about attention, here with the anterior single cortex, anteromedial nucleus in particular, and prefrontal, and to some of the anteroventral. Um, properties of space, some of which are quite specific, for example, with head direction, 
others which seemed much more general in terms of a whole variety of spatial signaling and spatial mechanisms, um, not just confined to head direction. And that this idea that space provides this really important contextual precursor to episodic memory is an idea that's become very, very fashionable over the last few years. Um, people like Eleanor Maguire, for example, uh, Neil Burgess, many others. And I, I, it's very hard. And it's, I think it's a very persuasive idea that this space is both needed both for encoding and also for retrieval of um, episodic type information. And at the same time, rather than think of the hippocampus as being subservient, sorry, the antiethylamic nuclei is subservient to the hippocampus, we're thinking of them as partners. And that for that reason, we want to look and consider where they are jointly acting. And of course, one thing they're jointly doing is acting upon cortical sites. And so we're tentatively interested in this idea of the sort of two memory streams that are acting in partnership on cortical areas in a way that's critical for um, long-term memory consolidation. And retrospinal cortex would be right at the top of list of places that you would look at. And there's some beautiful work done by Yamawaki um, a couple of years ago, um, looking at the ways in which interactions between the hippocampus and antiethylamic nuclei affect plasticity in retrospinal cortex. So, the key points I think I'm trying to get across to you are that think of the antiothelant nuclei and hippocampus as partners, not as I think has been sort of very hard not to think about as the antiothelant nuclei has been sort of downstream and they're sub subservient or secondary to the hippocampus. That the antiothelant nuclei add new functions by virtue of both outputs that they have that the hippocampus doesn't have and also afferents. That are not available. So, for example, the antiethylamine nuclei, along with nucleus reunions, are, I think, a very important subcortical route by which frontal areas influence and affect the hippocampus. That we need to sort of completely redraw, or even better still, just get rid of any sort of a no idea of paper circuit. That, in addition to space, we need to bring in the idea of the anterior flank nuclei also contributing to attention and their interaction in aspects of memory. That these three major nuclei, the anterodorsal, anteroventral, and anteromedial, have related but complementary functions. And that we should be thinking very hard about what happens in areas of convergence between the anterior flank nuclei and the hippocampal formation. And that is what I'd like to finish with. I'd like to thank very much a variety of people, but these three people in particular, um, Shane O'Mara, Andrew Nelson, and Emma Bubb, and my funding from the Wellcome Trust. And I think I'd like to uh, have some questions if it's possible. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. I think it was a really fantastic talk. I really, well, I've learned a lot. And I wonder how many people are going to delete quickly now that the circuit slides on the <laughs> next talk. <laughs>